Father Mark signing on. Continuing with the uh, 1840s, the decade of the 1840s, in the history of Catholicism in the United States. Uh, we are now moving into the, uh, the Mexican-American War, waged from April 24th, 1846, through February 2nd, 1848. President Polk, James Polk, P-O-L-K, ordered American troops into the new state of Texas to secure its border, which the United States recognized as being the Rio Grande River. Mexico did not recognize that border, so a skirmish took place on April 24th north of the Rio Grande River, but south of the Nueces River, which is what Mexico recognized as the border of the province of Tejas, which they did not recognize as having seceded from Mexico. The, <clears throat> um, the Mexicans won that, you know, that particular uh, skirmish. So Polk, President Polk, went to Congress accusing Mexico of killing Americans on American soil which resulted in Congress declaring war on Mexico on May 13th, 1846, lasted for two years. The uh, 11 Americans were killed. Uh, this is uh, an excerpt from Polk's address on May 11th to Congress. Uh, to the Senate and the House of Representatives. We have tried every effort at reconciliation. But now, after repeated threats, Mexico has passed the boundary of the United States and has invaded our territory and shed American blood upon American soil. Mexico has proclaimed that hostilities have commenced and that the two nations are now at war. As war exists, and notwithstanding all our efforts to avoid it, exists by the act of Mexico herself, we are called upon by every consideration of duty and patriotism to vindicate with decision the honor, the rights, and the interest of our country. In further vindication of our rights and defense of our territory, I invoke the prompt action of Congress to recognize the existence of war and to place at the disposal of the executive, meaning himself, the means of prosecuting the war with vigor and thus hastening the restoration of peace. End quote. So uh, the Mexican side of this, uh, the Mexican view of this, can be found um, by a, uh, a proclamation issued at Matamoros, Texas, by General Francisco uh, Mejia, M-E-J-I-A, on March 18, 1846. Uh, fellow, this is a quote from, from the general. Fellow citizens, the annexation of Texas to the United States does not yet satisfy the ambitious desires of the degenerate sons of Washington. Indelible is the stain of which will forever darken the character of the people of the United States. The right of conquest has always been a crime against humanity. Fellow countrymen, with an enemy which respects not its own laws, which shamefacedly derides the very principles invoked by it previously, in order to excuse its ambitious views, we have no other resource than arms. We are fortunately always prepared to take them up with glory in defense of our country and to assure our nationality and our independence. <clears throat> okay, um, the strategy, the American strategy, uh, was in several parts. First, an army under General Stephen Kearney um, would move, would muster at Fort Leavenworth on the Missouri River and march west. Second, 
an army under General Zachary Taylor would move south from San Antonio, would muster at San Antonio, Texas, and then march south into Mexico. Third, an amphibious assault force under General Winfield Scott would muster at New Orleans, right here, New Orleans, Louisiana, and uh, since it was a port, and uh, and they would attack Mexico from this from the sea, the, the, from the from the Gulf, so they would land at Veracruz on the on the Mexican Gulf Coast, and then march uh, west toward Mexico City, the capital. Fourth, a naval operation in the Pacific which consisted of support and blockading the Mexican Pacific port of Mazatlan. As the engagements occurred, we can't cover every battle, uh, but as the engagements occurred, it soon became clear that the American uh, implementation of interchangeable parts technology, which we covered previously, would prove decisive. Now, this is an industrial development, a commercial development. It was applied to weapons production, therefore had a military significance and therefore political significance. Because uh, this technology meant that American troops could rely on ammunition of uniform size, while the Mexicans could not. In addition, the American artillery was, uh, was uh, uh, of, a, of a higher quality, a more recent forging, and was able to fire accurately for 300 yards, could fire a projectile 300 yards once every 15 seconds without overheating and exploding. Whereas the Mexican artillery was obsolete, uh, Napoleonic vintage, uh, so had a shorter range because they, the way they, they did it, they packed gunpowder you know, down the tube, then put the projectile on top of it and lit it. So uh, the older cannons could not could not take a large, you know, there was a limit to the amount of gunpowder you could stick down there without it blowing up the tube. And uh, and also there was a, a limit on the on the rate of fire because the tube, the, the you know, the, the metal tube, the cannon had to cool down. Otherwise it would overheat and it would blow up. <clears throat> and kill the, you know, kill the, uh, the artillery crew. Which means uh, the American art- the Americans with their artillery could engage and start uh, killing, bombarding, and Mexican troops before the Mexicans were even in range to return fire. So that's that's an immense tactical advantage on the battlefield, which of course would have strategic significance. Uh, so that all of that's the strategy. Uh, in addition to the plan, there were unplanned actions that took place. One of them took place one month after the war was declared. On June 15, 1846, Americans living in the Mexican province of Alta, California, which is the present-day state of California, on their own initiative, seized the Mexican garrison at Sonoma and declared California to be an independent republic just as Texas had done. And they used the bear as the insignia on their flag. Hence, you know, California is, is sometimes referred to as the bear republic, as Texas is, a, you know, the lone star republic because their initial sigil was just one star at the center of their flag. Soon, an American army captain, uh, John Charles Fremont, was uh, who was in the region on already on a, on a surveying expedition. Uh, he arrived and on his own initiative took over operations at Sonoma. July 7th, 1846. Commodore John Sloat in the, the Pacific Theater, so he attacking from the Pacific. Uh, he captured Monterey, California. Two days later, July 9th, another theater of operation, this one, uh, in the south, Santa Fe, in what is now the state of New Mexico, was captured by General Kearney. And Kearney then, instead of marching south uh, into Mexico, he marched west to California, to the, to the Pacific. While the U.S. was engaged in fighting Mexico, President Polk uh, uh, completed 
secured nego- uh, completion of negotiations for the Oregon Territory. His Secretary of State was James Buchanan, who later became president himself. Uh, and Buchanan, representing the United States, negotiated with uh, Sir Richard Packingham, who was the British envoy to the United States. And these negotiations set what was disputed, the boundary between the United States and, and British Canada, uh, west of the Great Lakes. It established the border at the 49th parallel, excluding Vancouver Island which was retained in its entirety by the British. So Oregon, uh, later, after the Mexican War, became the 33rd U.S. state on February 14th, 1859. And Washington State was, was carved out of the Oregon Territory to become State 42 on November 11th, 1889. Um. So uh, you see, uh, so here is uh, the Rio Grande border between Mexico and Texas. Uh, and here the, the states are all, well, the, the, uh, this was all considered, Mexico considered all this part of Mexico over here to Texas. Now, Oregon and, and Washington uh, and, and parts of Idaho, actually up to this river, were considered the Oregon Territory. And so this is what was simply purchased. So Polk managed to do this. Um, just as he had tried to buy all of this from Mexico, but Mexico refused. And just as, you know, so anyway, this the, the, the theater of operations is over here. And as we'll see while I have the map out, um, the uh, the attack. So here's, uh, it all looks backwards to me. I mean, yeah, okay, so that's, um, there's the New Orleans, Louisiana. And uh, so later there would be an attack on, uh, on Mexico from uh, this side of Veracruz. And then uh, they would march uh, march inland toward uh, Mexico City. And uh, that's where the, the final culminating battle would be outside of uh, Mexico City. <clears throat> the uh, Oregon Trail, the Oregon-California Trail, uh, was a 2,170-mile overland trail uh, from Independence, Missouri to Oregon City, which was uh, near the present-day site of Portland, Oregon, in the uh, Willamette River Valley. The Oregon Trail was one of the two main routes to the American West in the 19th century, the other being the, the uh, Santa Fe Trail, which was the southern route, which also the, they would muster at Independence, Missouri, and then go, uh, head to Santa Fe, which is now New Mexico and then over to California, Southern California. In addition, there were branches from each each of the main trails provided connections to destinations in California and a spur uh, to the, which would connect the Santa Fe route to the Oregon route, part of the Oregon Trail. And another branch from the Northern route led to the Great Salt Lake region in what is now the state of Utah. Catholicism now in Oregon and Washington. Uh, we saw uh, earlier uh, Father Dismi, who was a Belgian missionary, Jesuit Belgian missionary, uh, lay the foundations. Uh, but largely with interactions, his interactions with the indigenous tribes. So now, how the regular hierarchy established in the region, how did that happen? This introduces us to Francois Norbert Blanchet. B-L-A-N-C-H-E-T. Lived from 1795 to 1883. He was born in uh, Canada, present-day Quebec, along with his brother, Augustine Maglior Blanchet. He entered the seminary in Quebec, 
was ordained a priest in 1819. Francois spent uh, a year after his ordination working at the cathedral in Quebec before being assigned to do missionary work with the Mi'kmaq and the Acadian peoples in present-day New Brunswick. That's eastern Canada. Uh, in order to be able to preach to the local Irish immigrants, Blanchet learned and, and became fluent in English. In 1827, he was transferred to Montreal, where he was made a pastor. Beginning in 1830, French-Canadian Catholic uh, employees of the Hudson Bay Company requested that priests be sent to the Oregon Territory to, to, bring, to bring them the sacraments, you know, the, the, uh, and not, you know, not, not to, the, to, the, uh, to the tribal, to the indigenous people like uh, Dismi did, but to bring the sacraments to them and their families. <clears throat> Francois Blanchet was appointed uh, vicar general of the Oregon country. That's what the British called Canada was part of the British Empire at this point, and so they referred to the the Oregon Territory, as we would say, as the Oregon country. He went with a fellow priest, Modeste de Mears, to, uh, to, for the missionary effort. The two priests, along with some nuns and lay people, uh, departed from Quebec on May 3rd, 1838. They traveled along with the York Factory Express. And uh, earlier when we covered Father Dismay, we saw the, the practical advantages of why clergy would do that, would travel with these commercial uh, endeavors. Arriving on November 18th at Fort Nez Perce, which was a Hudson Bay Company fur trade outpost, located in the present state of Washington. Blanchet celebrated Mass, baptized three Catholic converts, adults. In November, later in November that year, they arrived at Fort Vancouver in present-day Vancouver, Washington, which is distinct from Vancouver Island, Canada. Beginning on January 3, 1839, Blanchet, uh, uh, along with uh, with uh, other two other priests, went to the French prairie farms maintained by French Canadians along the river, along the Columbia River. So the uh, first Catholic mass south of the Columbia River in the uh, Oregon country was celebrated by Blanchet on January 6th. Now, I should say there are a couple of historical caveats there. Because of uh, Father Demir's, uh, Father Dismee's many travels, the Jesuit missionary we covered earlier, he, it is entirely possible that he said Mass uh, south of the Columbia River. Uh, but if he did, it was, it was just it was for the uh, tribal, the indigenous people. Uh, this is the first recorded Mass that is uh, absolutely known to have taken place south of the Columbia River in the Oregon country um, for... Uh, the descendants of Europeans, you know, if we come from Canada or from England. Blanchet remained there for five weeks. On December 1st, 1843, Pope Gregory XVI established the Apostolic Vicariate of the Oregon Territory and named uh, France, Father Francois Blanchet as its Apostolic Vicar. So remember what that, the, the different levels of uh, ecclesiastical organization in missionary territory. Uh, the, the, the first level of organization, uh, well, no, I should say, the, well, the first level is, is a bishop who's not resident in that area, just sending priest or religious order sending priest. But once, um, so the levels of on-site organization, first to be an apostolic prefect, who is a priest assigned by the apostolic see, which is Rome. <clears throat> In terms of holy orders, an apostolic prefect is just a priest, but is granted additional faculties, such as that priest can celebrate the sacrament of confirmation. The next level is apostolic vicar, uh, which is a bishop, an ordained bishop, so has the fullness of holy orders, meaning he can ordain new priest. But canonically, he is considered an auxiliary bishop of the Diocese of Rome, 
which is the apostolic see, hence a vicar apostolic, a vicar of the apostolic see. And uh, so Blanchet was named the, the apostolic vicar. Now, you need three bishops to ordain a new bishop, and there were no bishops out west, so Blanchet had to journey home to Quebec in order to be ordained a bishop. This took place on July 25th, 1845, uh, by the Archbishop um, and uh, <clears throat> Archbishop Ignace Bourget at Mary Queen of the World Cathedral in Montreal. <clears throat> on July 24th, 1846, the next Pope, Pius IX, divided the Apostolic Vicariate into three dioceses. First, Oregon City, which later became Portland, Oregon, and Blanchet, Francois Blanchet, was named founding bishop. Second, Vancouver Island, not Vancouver, Washington, Vancouver Island, which is British Columbia, that's Canada, and uh, one of the priests who, the, who went with Blanchet was named its founding bishop, Modeste de Mears. Third, Walla Walla, Washington, uh, and... Uh, Blanchet's, Francois Blanchet's brother, Augustin Blanchet, was appointed bishop, founding bishop of Walla Walla. Now, the Diocese of Walla Walla is now defunct. Uh, afterwards, uh, bishops, uh, it became, the diocese was suppressed and renamed to the Diocese of Nesquali. And then that was, that name, that was changed to the Archdiocese of Seattle, which is what it is now. The Diocese of Oregon City, where Francois Blanchet was the founding bishop, was elevated to an archdiocese on July 29, 1850, and Francois Blanchet was still bishop, so he became its, also its first archbishop. He retired in 1880 and died three years later, 1883, and was interred in St. Paul's Cemetery in St. Paul, Oregon. All right. Uh, the second one, uh, Modeste de Mears. He was uh, also Quebecois, uh, born 1809 in Quebec of, uh, of European French descent, uh, studied uh, at the same seminary in, in Quebec, ordained 1836. Two years later, 1838, uh, Father de Mears uh, traveled with Francois Blanchet to the Willamette Valley of what later became the state of Oregon. De Mears quickly immersed himself uh, in work with the local uh, trading post staff and their families. Uh, and even though that was his, his actual mission, uh, he also, on his own initiative, reached out to the indigenous uh, tribes. Uh, so he reached out to the uh, Chinookon, uh, the Chinooks, uh, and, and, and actually learned the language. And uh, he worked on creating a dictionary and a catechism, and a prayer book with some hymns in their language. <clears throat> De Mere's work carried him north all the way into present-day British Columbia, where his knowledge of French and English, as well as his affinity for learning native languages, uh, facilitated his success. In 1847, De Mears was consecrated Bishop of Vancouver Island, and uh, one of his friends was Sir James Douglas, was governor of Vancouver Island uh, and governor of British Columbia, Canada. And, or probably because, uh, uh, Sir James was head of the Hudson Bay Company operations in the District of the Columbia River. De Mears and Douglas had met years earlier when De Mears had first arrived at Fort Vancouver. Uh, De Mears died at his post on July 28, 1871. He was uh, uh, the, the Bishop of Vancouver. Well, that, that seat was then moved, so the diocese was renamed to Victoria. So he was the founding Bishop of Victoria. Uh, and that, that's where he died. And he's interred in the crypt uh, underneath the altar in the cathedral, St. Andrew's Cathedral in that city. The third was Francois Blanchet's brother, Augustine Maglior Blanchet. 
born 1797, and same in uh, present day Quebec. Younger brother of Francois. Went to the same seminary as the other the other guys, uh, the Quebec seminary. He was ordained a priest on June 3, 1821. Assigned to work first in Quebec and then east in Nova Scotia, uh, then around the Montreal area. On July 28, 1846, while in Montreal, Augustine Blanchet was appointed bishop of the new diocese of Walla Walla in the Oregon country, but uh, the part of the Oregon territory that is now the state of Washington, hence Walla Walla, Washington. Augustine Blanchet was therefore able to follow his brother Francois, who had already was had already spent a decade in the Oregon Territory and helped build the Catholic presence in the Oregon Washington area. <clears throat> uh, Augustine Blaché was ordained a bishop uh, for the Diocese of Oregon City um, I mean excuse me uh, Diocese of Walla Walla on September 27th 1846. Uh, he he also had to travel back to uh, to to, to uh, Montreal for this. He was ordained and by the same archbishop that ordained uh, the others, Ignace Bourget. But in this case, he was uh, in the Cathedral of Saint Jacques in Montreal. Uh, then he left, went back to Oregon uh, in uh, in March of 1847, and he arrived back on uh, at his new home on September 5th. He brought with him uh, three. Oblates of Mary Immaculate, the OMIs. Pascal Richard was the superior, and two brothers, who uh, whom the Bishop Augustine Blanchet ordained priest on January 2nd, 1848. So these three guys uh, were the first priest ordained in the Washington, Oregon Territory. Um uh, and uh, the other two, uh, Pascal Richard was already a priest, but the other two he ordained were uh, Eugene Chirous and Jean Pendaski. Father Eugene Chirous wrote a letter to Father Richard one year later describing missionary life in the Northwest Territory, the Oregon Territory. The letter is dated January 12, 1849 posted from Holy Cross Parish in Simcoe, in the area where the Yamima River meets the Columbia River. It reads in part, quote, A few days after my return from Nisqually, which is later became Seattle, I went to the camp of Kamayarkin, where I had built a small cabin with the aid of good brother Vernet and some... Well, he says, this, sorry, this is the word he uses, savages, and some savages. I'm sorry, that's, what, that's the word he used. Uh, St. Joseph is the patron whom the bishop, and this is referring to Augustine Blanchet, wished to give to this poor little house, and that great saint protected me until the winter. The cold commencing to make itself felt, the chief and all his Indians prepared to leave for their snow encampment on the Yakima River. They begged me to go, and spent the severest, uh, and, and I spent the severest season with them. I acceded to their request on condition that they build me a second cabin. In less than a month, the house was built from the trunks of poplar trees. My new dwelling, 30 feet long by 15 feet wide, gave me enough space to have two rooms, one for myself and one for the Assembly of Indians for prayer. It is there, Reverend Father, that the troubles the sorrows and the crosses of everyone fall on me like hail upon a young plant which is commencing to bud. That is why I call my new residence by the name of the Holy Cross. At this moment, again, I'm sorry, this is the word he uses, at this moment savages from nearly all the neighboring nations are assembled at Holy Cross. I count 60 cabins in my village, around 100 families. There I have Yellow Serpent, who was chief of the Takima tribe, with his following as opponent. He himself presides at all the abominations which are spoken or committed in his infernal den. All right, so this is, he's referring to uh, the, the indigenous peoples 
religion, their their folk religion. <clears throat> uh, so back to the quote. Um, an old trickster. He does his best to help uh, the old trickster. Uh, does his best to help him to embarrass me. Irritated because my instructions are contrary to his maxims and his diabolic acts. He has invented this strange calumny in order that I might be put to death. The black robe, he says, catches rattlesnakes and makes them vomit a black poison with which he poisons the tobacco with the intention of killing everyone. Yeah. So it went on like that, but you get the message. Uh, the following year, May 31st, 1850, Pope Pius IX created the Diocese of Nisqually out of the defunct Diocese of Walla Walla, and uh, Augustine Blanchet was its uh, move to become its bishop. The Episcopal See was, just to confuse things, was in Vancouver, but not Vancouver in British Columbia, Vancouver in what became Washington State. And uh, on January, in January of 1851, Bishop Augustine Blanchet dedicated St. James Church near Fort Vancouver as the new diocesan, diocesan cathedral. And uh, a new St. James Cathedral uh, was later built uh, in Vancouver, Washington in 1885. Uh, Bishop Blanchet retired on December 23, 1879 at the age of 82. He continued to live in the Diocese of Nisqually in his retirement and uh, died in Vancouver, Washington, on February 25, 1887. And the Diocese of Nisqually was later uh, became Seattle, Washington. Okay, so that's that, that all that started during the Mexican War. I mean, not connected to it causally, but it's just, you know, the, the, that's, that's just what happened. So uh, back to the war. 1846, uh, September 21st through 24th, uh, General Zachary Taylor captured Monterey, Mexico. So we saw Admiral Sloat captured Monterey, another Monterey. That was in California. This was Monterey, Mexico. The next month, October 1846, um, the Californios, who were Mexican residents, Mexican citizens, citizens of the Mexican Republic living in Alta California. Uh, they attacked the Americans, the Americans who had declared the Bear Republic, uh, on behalf of Mexico. And uh, this was done without coordination from Mexico City. I mean, as we saw, they, you know, they went through four presidents just in one year. So, um, you know, the Mexican people were, were failed by their government uh, again and again in, in, you know, grotesque fashion. <clears throat> and uh, the Californios fought uh, using their own weapons, improvised, but they they but without you know logistical and military support, uh, they they eventually ran out of of uh, material, so they surrendered on January twelfth, eighteen forty seven. The following month, February twenty third, eighteen forty seven, the Battle of Buena Vista took place seven miles south of Saltillo, Mexico. Um, so those of seminarians said, um, well, I don't know, I guess you don't anymore, but um, there, there was uh, St. Ben's, you know, those of you who went to St. Ben's. Uh, Saltillo is a place where St. Ben's would take the seminarians for their mission trip uh, when, I was, when I was there. So um, as any of you or any of the... Priest in your diocese, my age, uh, can tell you about Saltillo. Padre Quinn, Padre, uh, was an Irish missionary. Uh, he was there in Saltillo. It was uh, I mean, he's deceased now, but back in uh, 1990, he was uh, uh, he was he was a legend down there. Anyway, Battle of Buena Vista. <clears throat> uh, it was American victory. American artillery won the victory, and that you know because of. As I explained, the American artillery, the, the Americans could, could launch an artillery barrage and start killing Mexicans before the Mexicans were in range, were, you know, were close enough to return fire with their older artillery. All right, at this point, having taken uh, California and northern Mexico, President Polk attempted to open negotiations with Mexico 
uh, wanting Mexico to recognize the American conquest as a basis for peace, with the Rio Grande River as the border between them. The government of Mexico refused, because, uh, I mean, for reasons we've already seen, I mean, functionally it had no government, because it was in the middle of a civil war itself at the same time that it was fighting this war with the United States. Uh, so President Polk ordered that, uh, that the capital of Mexico be captured. Is in the 18th and 19th centuries, that was just the way war was done. When you capture the enemy capital, then they're supposed to surrender. As Napoleon learned <laughs> when he invaded Russia, it didn't always work out that way. Uh, when Napoleon got to Moscow, he took it. You know, he, he won the battle. But then the Russians burned down their own city rather than, <laughs> rather than surrender or let him have it. So, you know, the rules of war didn't always work. Uh, but anyway, that was, that's what he was thinking. On March 9, 1847, General Winfield Scott conducted the first amphibious landing in American military history in order to take Veracruz, Mexico. Uh, that's, so he's the one that mustered in New Orleans, uh, had the, you know, the naval, uh, the, the troops were transported by ship and, uh, into the Gulf, and they attacked Mexico f on the east coast, uh, Veracruz, with 12,000 troops. Among the troops under his command in this operation were names that would figure prominently 20 years later in the war between the states of the Civil War. Robert E. Lee, George Meade, Ulysses S. Grant, future president, uh, Stonewall ja Thomas Jackson, but he's, his nickname was Stonewall Jackson, uh, Longstreet, etc. Many of these guys that were junior officers, all of them were West Point graduates. After capturing Veracruz, Scott and his army marched west toward an inland toward Mexico City, which is which is quite a distance. I mean, I think it's two hundred miles, and uh, as Mexico and you go, you're going up, so you know it's it's, it's, it's an elevate. It's not a it's not an easy trip. The following month, April eighteenth, eighteen forty seven, about halfway there, halfway between Veracruz and Mexico City, is a place called Cerro Gordo. Cerro, Cerro, C E R R O, G O R D O. And uh, there, uh, Santa Ana reappears. Um, he was minus one leg that he lost in fighting uh, the French invasion that occurred in the previous decade. I mentioned that in the, an earlier video. Uh, but he, he was still, you know, Jenny, he had 25,000 troops. And uh, it, was, it was obvious what the Americans were doing, that they were going to Mexico City. So they had to put up a fight. So he engaged them with 25,000 troops. Before we see the result, uh, go, sticking with the chronology, the following month, so this was April 18th, 1847, the following month, on May 4th, 1847, the Diocese of Galveston, Texas, was created. Uh, and this is the where Bishop Jean-Marie Odin the Apostolic Vicar of Texas, re-enters our story. While the war was in progress, the Holy See gave Texas, raised it to the final level of ecclesiastical organization, meaning its own resident bishop, its own ordinary jurisdiction, and that is a diocese. And Odin, who was already the Apostolic Vicar, he was named founding bishop. So this, the Diocese of Galveston, uh, was the mother diocese from which uh, the Diocese of San Antonio would be carved 27 years later, and then from San Antonio, others would be would be carved. Uh, Bishop Odin's ecclesiastical jurisdiction did not precisely conform to the what are now the current political boundaries of the state of Texas, because in 1847 those legal boundaries had not that had not yet been established, and it would not be until after the war was resolved. However, the presence of an ordinary bishop residing in Texas and not an ordinary from another state exercising long-distance jurisdiction represented a definitive step forward in the history of the Catholic Church in Texas. Bishop Odin contributed to the building of the church there by inviting religious orders to work in the state, religious orders who were not tied to the previous Mexican context or to the even earlier Spanish colonial context. Prominent orders of women, religious, 
that responded to his invitation included the Ursuline sisters, a teach order of teaching sisters. Uh, they teach girls, teach, you know, good girl schools. Uh, also the Incarnate Word sisters. Initially, their ministry was nursing. They were nursing sisters. But later, they expanded their ministry to include orphanages and then schools. So um, uh, the, the way it happened, it happened organically. So there were nursing sisters. But, um, you know, there were plagues periodically, cholera, typhus, yellow fever, in which case the medicine at the time really had nothing to do except to try to make the person comfortable. until And then the body the body would either fight it off and they'd get better or they would die. And when they die, they'd, you know, they'd have children there. And so that, so the nuns established an orphanage just, you know, de facto, they couldn't, you know, they wouldn't just throw these orphan kids out. So, and then as the kids grew up, as they grew, they needed some education. So then they just, okay, well, we're going to teach them at least basic reading, writing, and arithmetic. So that's how the, so the Ursulines were always a teaching order. But the Incarnate Word sisters were originally nursing and then just out of necessity organically became also uh, um, in, the, in the orphanage and, and education ministry. Religious orders of men who responded to Odin's invitation, including the Oblates of Mary Immaculate, the OMIs, they specialized in multilingual ministry. Another group, the Marianist Brothers, whose ministry focused on educating boys, Bishop Odin crowned his efforts to establish all the elements of institutional Catholicism in Texas in the year 1852 when he founded the first Catholic college in Texas. It still exists. This is St. Mary's University. By the end of his time in Texas, when he was transferred to New Orleans, he had increased the number of priests to 84 and the number of churches to 50. Uh, <clears throat> following the death of the Archbishop of New Orleans, Antoine Blanc, the French missionary Antoine Blanc, he died in June of 1860. And Bishop Odin of Galveston was appointed to follow him as the second Archbishop. The, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, the fifth Bishop, but the second Archbishop of New Orleans on February 15th, 1861. <clears throat> but, um, no, let's see. So, uh, but 1847 is when the Diocese of Galveston was created. Uh, so going back to 1847 and the Mexican War. September 12th to 13th. At, oh, the Battle of Cerro Gordo. Uh, so it was a um, uh, an American victory for the same reason as the other ones had been. Uh, the, the technological advantage of the artillery. September 12th to 13th, 1847. A fortress outside of Mexico City it was Chapultepec. It was, uh, uh, and that's where another battle occurred. So after winning Cerro Gordo, the Americans continued the march towards Mexico City. And uh, this one, and some of you, you know, seminarians who are from Mexico, I'm sure this is, you know, part of your, part of your history. They teach that uh, many civilians in the city, uh, even uh, um, uh, a military school, uh, Mexican military, the students went out. And they, you know, they, they were depleted of, of resources because Mexico had been in, in a civil war, a state of civil war, for, you know, over a decade before this. So they had swords, you know, and, and they were, you know, they were fighting against cannons. But and they put up a fight. It was it was a hard fought battle, uh, ended with an American victory once again, owing to the technological advantages. And then uh, the American army occupied Mexico City. With that, with the Battle of Chapultepec, uh, militarily. The war was over, uh, but officially, uh, uh, the Mexican War ended on February second, eighteen forty-eight, with the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Uh, Guadalupe is a suburb of Mexico City, you know where the the church of Our Lady Guadalupe. Uh, by the terms of the treaty, Mexico ceded to the United States. Uh, much of the land that became the Western United States, including California. Uh, and this took the American Republic all the way to the Pacific Ocean. This, uh, this was nine days, coincidentally, uh, this was nine days after gold was discovered in California. But before 
news of the discovery of gold had spread to either Mexico or Washington, D.C. The uh, Mexican-American War had a tremendous impact on the history of both countries. For the United States, this was the country's first foreign war fought almost entirely in foreign territory. As we saw earlier in the course, the United States invaded Canada more than once and fought battles in Canadian territory when it was, uh, obviously it was British territory, but you know, in what is now Canada. Um, but, but the entirety of the war was not fought on Canadian soil. Uh, this one, you know, was fought on, uh, largely on Mexican soil. The war was also uh, very divisive uh, internally. This was not universally supported by Americans. Uh, further, as we'll see, uh, it exacerbated the slavery issue uh, by uh, politics in, in Washington because the, the absorption of, of all that territory you know, as states, because most of the territory was south of the Mason-Dixon line, so that would all be slave states according to the Missouri Compromise. Yet, the topography, like you know, the, the very arid topography in Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California, did not lend itself to plantations, you know, large scale agricultural. So, the the PE, you know, the Americans who went there, they weren't looking, they weren't looking to, to expand slavery. But for political reasons, as we'll see, the, the existing slave states in the South still wanted them to be slave states so that the numerical balance between slave and free would remain in the Senate. So then, you know, the free states would not outnumber the slave states and then legislate slavery out of existence. Another negative factor was obviously the cost in human lives. Um, 5,800 Americans uh, were killed in this war. 28,000 Mexicans were killed in the war. Um, uh, there were in Mexico uh, there were seven presidents during the war because uh, uh, as we saw there was a civil war going on simultaneously uh, with the war against American America and the Mexicans uh, you know could refer to this as you know as, as American aggression as, as you know an American invasion, which you know, which was completely lacking in injustice. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what happened. So history's history. Same year that the war ended, eighteen forty-eight. Uh, Karl Marx reenters our story. We uh, we encountered him earlier in eighteen forty-three in a, a writing uh, specifically critiquing religion. Uh, where we found his famous quote that religion is the opium of the masses, you know, prom, you know, asserting his atheist prejudice. In 1848 was the invention, so to speak, of communism uh, or revolutionary socialism with the uh, Communist Manifesto, the publication of a pamphlet, the Communist Manifesto. It became the, the defining, the proto-work of revolutionary socialism. Now, there were different forms of socialism. As you know, utopian socialism, uh, moderate, you know, uh, social de social democracy, um, which allowed some private property, but communism is the is the most extreme, and so it's revolutionary. So it's built it, it brought about by violence, uh, to complete atheism, uh, no toleration for you know uh, religion at all, any religion. It's not just anti-Catholic, just anti-religious. Uh, no private property. You know, so the moderate social socialism, the social social democrats, or the democratic socialism, would be one that where the state owns, or the you know the the society you knows what this that so that owns the uh, uh, major utilities, major means of production, certain things are nationalized like education, later health care. But it is still possible to own private property and have small businesses, whereas with communism, that's not, you know, if they're following ideological communism strictly, then there is no private property. Uh, there are no private businesses. <clears throat> so uh, in the quote I'm going to read from the Communist Manifesto, uh, that we, we, there are two terms that, that are used frequently and became standard in communist discourse. Uh, 
and therefore in writings about communism, even by people who were not communists, but they, they used the terms because, you know, that was used. So the two terms are the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Okay, first, bourgeoisie. Uh, spelled B O U R G E O I S I E. Bourgeoisie. French term uh, derived from the French word for a town dweller. So a burg is a city, like to pick Pittsburgh. It just means city. Uh, and uh, so bourgeoisie is a is a person who dwells in the city. So does the town dweller. As distinct from a peasant, you know, who, who dwells outside of this, it would dwell on, you know, on the farms. Now this uh, term later, it later was expanded to, uh, you know, the, it, so some connotations were accreted around this word, town dweller. So uh, think of some in a, a modern analogy, say the, the term, uh, uh, the city boy. You know, the city boy, you know, you kind of they have associations with that name, uh, many of which might be inaccurate. But someone who's living in the country, when they say the city kid, you know, or, or a city guy, or city girl, you know, there's certain negative connotations with that. Um, and so that's that's what happened with the term bourgeoisie, some negative connotations with that, that, that were not necessarily rooted in reality. I mean, not every single person who lived in a town had these same characteristics. But it, but for rhetoric, public rhetoric, um, it, it's it's convenient to class people together because then it's always, it's them, you know, it's it's that other group. <clears throat> so um, the bourgeoisie, when it was used pejoratively, uh, referred to uh, um, what was caricatured as narrow-minded, conventional, middle-class. Uh, social mores supported by uh, middle class economics, you know, the tradesmen, business people, uh, bankers, uh, but those who, from as the, the rhetoric developed, uh, those who, from a peasant's perspective, did not actually produce anything. You know, there were middlemen, you know, like they, they took. Like for the peasants, you know, they would say, "Okay, we we actually grow or we grow the animals, we breed the animals, uh, we chop down the trees, you know, we grow the fruit and grain and you know crops and you know the, milk the cows, take the eggs from the chicken. We do all of that, and even tradesmen who do actually produce something. Well, the peasants, well, we we chop the wood that for what they from what they that then they use the wood to make houses for the banker, you know, uh, or something like that. So they're they're not so that the, there was a, a the the rhetorical the communist would, would when they use the term bourgeoisie it meant parasitic people who do not actually produce anything but who because of an artificial structure to society are able to parasite off of those who actually do the work who actually do produce so while the term originally a bourgeois just meant someone who dwelt in a town but it later in in, in its usage when you say bourgeoisie it was you know it was like we'd say the frat boy or the city boy uh, the other term, proletariat or proletarian, um, it's uh, uh, derives from a, a Latin term. Actually, proles means uh, offspring or progeny. Uh, so you know, um, in in the as far back as the Roman Republic, that term, uh, the proles, the proletarius, uh, they were they were the citizens. They were citizens. They were citizens. But the, the Romans considered them of the lowest class because they, they did not own property. And um, so all they did from the Roman, you know, the, all they did was have children. That was their only contribution to the Republic is that they, they, were, they were citizens, they had children. And, you know, for the, for the Roman perspective, the, then these children, their only use could be to put in the legions to go murder and steal from other people. So... Um, the communist rhetoric appropriated that, uh, but adopted it with pride. Is that okay? So the upper class—that's all they see us as, 
you know, so they, they want to make us feel, we the peasants, we the proletarians, make us feel that that's all we're good for. You know, we just have babies and, and then die. Whereas you know, the communists would assert that the, the proletarians are the ones who, are the only ones who have legitimate claim on, on pride because they're the ones who actually produce. They're the actual laborers. Um, okay, so with that in mind, here is an excerpt from the Communist Manifesto. Quote, A specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. All the powers of old Europe have entered into a holy alliance to exorcise the specter. Pope and Tsar, Metternich and Guizot, French radicals and German police spies. Where is the party in opposition that has not been decried as communistic by its opponents? Where is the opposition that has not hurled back the branding reproach of communism? against the more advanced opposition parties, as well as against its reactionary adversaries. Two things result from this fact. First, communism is already acknowledged by all European powers to be itself a power. Second, it is high time that communists should openly, in the face of the whole world, publish their views, their aims, their tendencies, and meet this nursery tale of the specter of communism with a manifesto of the party itself. To this end, communists of various nationalities have have assembled in London and sketched the following manifesto to be published in the English, the French, the German, the Italian, the Flemish, and the Danish languages. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guild master and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to each other, carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open, fight, a fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstruction of society or in the common ruin of all contending classes. In the earlier epochs of history, we find almost everywhere a complicated arrangement of society into various orders, a manifold gradation of social rank. In ancient Rome, we have patricians, knights, plebeians, slaves. In the Middle Ages, feudal lords, vassals, guildmasters, journeymen, apprentices, serfs. In almost all these classes, again, subordinate gradations. The modern bourgeois society that has sprouted from the ruins of feudal society has not done away with class antagonisms. It has but established new classes, new conditions of oppression, new forms of struggle in place of the old. Our epoch This is Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels writing in the mid-19th century, so our epoch, meaning the mid-19th century. The epoch of the bourgeoisie possesses, however, this distinct feature. It has simplified class antagonisms. Society as a whole is more and more splitting up into two great hostile camps, into two great classes facing each other, bourgeoisie, proletariat. From the serfs of the Middle Ages sprang the chartered burghers of the early towns. From these burgesses, the first elements of the bourgeoisie were developed. The the discovery of America, the rounding of the Cape, opened up fresh ground for the rising bourgeoisie. The East Indian, the Chinese markets, the colonization of America, trade with the colonies, The increase in the means of exchange and in commodities generally gave to commerce, to navigation, to industry, an impulse never before known, and therefore to the revolutionary element in the tottering feudal society, a rapid development. The feudal system of industry, and by feudal he's talking about the Middle Ages, the feudal system of industry 
in which industrial production was monopolized by closed guilds, now no longer sufficed for the growing wants of the new markets. The manufacturing system took its place. The guild masters were pushed on one side by the manufacturing middle class. Division of labor between the different corporate guilds vanished in the face of division of labor in each single workshop. Meantime, the markets kept ever growing, the demand ever rising. Even manufacturer no longer sufficed. Thereupon, steam and machinery revolutionized industrial production. The place of manufacture was taken by the giant modern industry. The place of the industrial middle class by the industrial millionaires. The leaders of the whole industrial armies, the modern bourgeoisie. Modern industry has established the world market for which the discovery of America paved the way. This market has given an immense development to commerce, to navigation, to communication by land. This development has, in its turn, reacted to the extension of industry. And in proportion, as industry, commerce, navigation, railways extended, in the same proportion, the bourgeoisie developed, increased its capital, and pushed into the background, every class handed down from the Middle Ages. We see, therefore, how the modern bourgeoisie is itself the product of a long course of development, a series of revolutions in the modes of production and exchange. Each step in the development of the bourgeoisie was accompanied by a corresponding political advance of that class. An oppressed class, under the sway of feudal nobility, an armed and self-governing association in the medieval commune, here an independent republic, as in Germany and Italy, there a taxable third estate of the monarchy, as in France. Afterward, in the period of manufacturing proper, serving either the semi-feudal or the absolute monarchy as a counterpoise against the nobility, and in fact cornerstone of the great monarchies in general, the bourgeoisie has at last, since the establishment of modern industry in the world market, conquered for itself in the modern representative state, exclusive political sway. The executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the bourgeoisie. The weapons with which the bourgeoisie felled feudalism to the ground are now turned against the bourgeoisie itself. But, now, but not only has the bourgeoisie forged the weapons that bring death to itself, it has also called into existence the men who are to wield those weapons, the modern working class, the proletariat. In proportion, as the bourgeoisie, that is, capital, is developed, in the same proportion is the proletariat, the modern working class, developed, a class of laborers who live only so long as they find work and who find work only so long as their labor increases capital. These laborers, who must sell themselves piecemeal as a commodity, like every other article of commerce, and are consequently exposed to all the vicissitudes of competition, to all the fluctuations of the market. Owing to the extensive use of machinery and to the division of labor, the work of the proletarians has lost all individual character and consequently all charm for the workman. He becomes an appendage of the machine and it is only the most simple, most monotonous, and most easily acquired knack that is required of him. Hence the cost of production of a workman is restricted almost entirely to the means of subsistence that he requires for maintenance and for the propagation of his race. But the price of a commodity, and therefore also of labor, is equal to the cost of its production. In proportion, therefore, as the repulsiveness of the work increases, the wage decreases. 
nay, more, in proportion as the use of machinery and division of labor increases. In the same proportion, the burden of toil increases, whether by prolongation of working hours, by the increase of the work exacted in a given time, or by increased speed of machinery, which he must service. Modern industry has converted the little workshop of the patriarchal master into the great factory of the industrial capitalist. Masses of laborers crowded into factories are organized like soldiers. As privates of the industrial army, they are placed under the command of a perfect hierarchy of officers and sergeants. Not only are they slaves of the bourgeois class and of the bourgeois state, they are daily and hourly enslaved by the machine, by the overseer, and above all by the individual bourgeoisie manufacturer himself. The more openly this despotism proclaims gain to be its end and aim, the more petty, the more hateful, the more embittering it is. The less the skill and exertion of strength implied in manual labor, in other words, the more modern industry becomes developed, the more is the labor of men superseded by that of women. Differences of age and sex have no longer any distinctive social validity for the working class. All are instruments of labor, more or less expensive to use according to their age and sex. No sooner is the exploitation of the laborer by the manufacturer so far at an end that he receives his wages in cash than he is set upon by the other portions of the bourgeoisie, the landlord, the shopkeeper, the pawnbroker. The lower strata of the middle class, the small tradespeople, shopkeepers, and retired tradesmen generally, the handicraftsmen, and the peasants. All these sink gradually into the proletariat, partly because their diminutive capital does not suffice for the scale on which modern industry is carried on. It is swamped in the competition with the large capitalist, partly because their specialized skill is rendered worthless by the new means of machine production. Thus the proletariat is recruited from all classes of the population. But with the development of industry, the proletariat not only increases in number, it becomes concentrated in greater masses. Then its strength grows. It feels that strength more. The various interests and conditions of life within the ranks of the proletariat are more and more equalized in proportion as machinery obliterates all distinctions of labor and nearly everywhere reduces wages to the same low level. The growing competition among the bourgeoisie and the resulting commercial crises make the wages of the workers ever more fluctuating. Here and there, a contest breaks out into riots. Now and then, the workers are victorious, but only for a time. The real fruit of their battle lies not in the immediate result, but in the ever-expanding union of the workers. This union is helped on by the improved means of communication that are created by modern industry, and that places the workers of different localities in contact with one another. It was just this contact that was needed to centralize the numerous local struggles, all of the same character, into one national struggle between classes. But every class struggle is a political struggle. And that union to attain which the bourgeoisie of the Middle Ages with their miserable highways required centuries, the modern proletariat thanks to the railways, achieves in a few years. This organization of the proletariat into classes, and consequently into a political party, is continually being upset again by the competition between the workers themselves. But it ever rises up again, stronger, firmer, mightier. Of all the classes that stand face to face with the bourgeoisie today, the proletariat alone is a truly revolutionary class. The other classes decay and finally disappear in the face of modern industry. The proletariat is its special 
and essential product. In the condition of the proletariat, those of old society at large are already virtually swamped. The proletariat is without property. His relation to his wife and children has no longer anything in common with the bourgeois family relations. Modern industry labor, modern subjection to capital, the same in England as in France, in America as in Germany, has stripped him of every trace of national character. Law, morality, religion are to him so many bourgeois prejudices, behind which lurk in ambush just as many bourgeois interests. Though not in substance, yet in form, the struggle of the proletariat with the bourgeoisie is at first a national struggle. The proletariat of East Country must, of course, first of all settle matters with its own bourgeoisie. In depicting the most general phases of the development of the proletariat, we trace the more or less veiled civil war raging within existing society up to the point where that war breaks out into open revolution and where the violent overthrow the bourgeoisie lays the foundation for the sway of the proletariat. Hitherto, every form of society has been based, as we have already seen, on the antagonism of oppressing and oppressed classes. But in order to oppress a class, certain conditions must be assured to it under which it can at least continue its slavish existence. And here it becomes evident that the bourgeoisie is unfit any longer to be the ruling class in society and to impose its conditions of existence upon society as an overriding law. It is unfit to rule because it is, because it is incompetent to assure an existence to its slave within his slavery, because it cannot help letting him sink into such a state that it has to feed him instead of being fed by him. Society can no longer live under this bourgeoisie. In other words, its existence is no longer compatible with this society. The essential conditions for the existence and for the sway of the bourgeoisie is the formation and augmentation of capital. The condition for capital is wage labor. Wage labor rests exclusively on competition between the laborers. The advance of industry, whose involuntary promoter is the bourgeoisie, replaces the isolation of the laborers due to competition by the revolutionary combination due to association. The development of modern industry, therefore, cuts from under its feet the very foundation on which the bourgeoisie produces and appropriates production. What the bourgeoisie, therefore, produces, above all, are its own grave diggers. Its fall and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. All right, it goes on and on and on like that, but you get the message. Uh, okay, so communism and in, in its relation with church history uh, would prove to be uh, highly seductive in uh, two certain types of clergy. Uh, and in the 20th century, liberation theology. Uh, it was the culmination of this. That was 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 those promoted by churchmen uh, in Latin America, although they studied in France, uh, promoting the idea that 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 Marxism and Christianity could be synthesized in in such a way as to unite the oppressed to build the kingdom on earth. So uh, this movement was condemned by Pope now St. John Paul II because uh, while some of, of the analyses of Karl Marx are accurate historically, I mean, certainly there are oppressed and oppressors. I mean, that, you know, that, that's, just, that's because sin, sin exists. But uh, two elements that, that are irreconcilable with Christianity, first, the atheism, obviously, you know, I mean, that's, and uh, second, the promotion of violent class struggle. Now, there are other points, but they all flow from that. So, like, from the atheism comes a debased and inaccurate 
anthropology, philo- you know, the philosophy of the human person as being strictly material, strictly a material being, without a soul, without an eternal destiny. I mean, th- those things cannot be reconciled with Christianity. Okay, uh, neither Karl Marx nor the man that he parasited from for decades, Friedrich Engels, uh, ever actually worked, ever actually lived as, as a member of the working class. Friedrich Engels was the ungrateful son of a wealthy factory owner. Um, Karl Marx was the son of, I mean, he parasited off his father, who sent him to university to become a lawyer, and then Marx, behind his back, studied philosophy, you know, to become this radical, you know, who never actually, well, I mean, he would have thought he worked, you know, writing all this stuff, but you know, he, he never, certainly never worked in class. Uh, but the, the damage, as we'll see, I mean, that, that literally millions of people died uh, whenever communist, uh, whenever communism took over a country. Uh, so neither of them, they, they, so that, you know, they, they wrote this as a, um, you know, kind of an abstraction, but based on observation of the emerging industrial economy in England. So here is an account from an actual working class person, you know, in the same time period, but this one in the United States. Uh, so this lady's name was Harriet Robinson. She was the, eventually became uh, the wife of a newspaper editor. And uh, later in life, she provided an account of her early life as a female factory worker in Lowell, Massachusetts. From the age of 10 in 1834 to 1848. Uh, So that's 14 years. So from the age of 10 to 24. She worked in the textile mills of Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, So here's an excerpt quote. In what follows, I shall confine myself to a description of factory life in Lowell, Massachusetts from 1832 to 1848, since with that phase of early factory labor in New England, I am the most familiar because I was part of it. In 1832, Lowell was little more than a factory village. Five corporations were started, and the cotton mills belonging to them were building. Help was in great demand, and stories were told all over the country of the new factory place and the high wages that were offered to all classes of working people. Stories that reached the ears of mechanics and farmers' sons um, to have a new life, uh, to give a new life to lonely independent women from distant towns and farmhouses. Troops of young girls came from different parts of New England and from Canada, and men were employed to collect them at so much a head and deliver them at the factories. If that sounds like human trafficking, well, you know, yeah. At the time, this is continuing the quote, uh, at the time uh, the Lowell Cotton Mills were started, the cast of the factory girl was the lowest among the employments of women. In England and in France particularly, great injustice had been done to her real character. She was represented as, a su- as subjected to influences that must destroy her purity and self-respect. In the eyes of her overseer, she was but a brute, a slave, to be beaten, pinched, and pushed about. It was to overcome this prejudice that such high wages has been offered to women that they might be induced to become mill girls, in spite of the opprobrium that still clung to this degrading occupation. The early mill girls were of different ages. Some were not over ten years old. A few were in midlife but the majority were between the ages of 16 and 25. The very young girls were called doffers. They doffed, meaning they took off, the full bobbins from the spinning frames and replaced them with empty ones. They were paid $2 a week. The working hours of all the girls extended from 5 o'clock in the morning until 7 o'clock in the evening, with one half hour each for breakfast and dinner. The most prevailing incentive to labor was to secure the means of education for some male member of the family, to make a gentleman of a brother or a son, to give him a college education, was the dominant thought in the minds of a great many of the better class of mill girls. I have known more than one to give every cent of her wages month after month to her brother, that he might get the education necessary to enter some profession. I have known a mother to work years in this way for her boy. 
I have known women to educate young men by their earnings who were not sons or relatives. There are many men now living who were helped to an education by the wages of the early mill girls. One of the first strikes that ever took place in this country was in Lowell in 1836. When it was announced that the wages were to be cut, great indignation was felt, and it was decided to strike or turn out en masse. This was done. The mills were shut down. The girls went from their several corporations in procession to the grove on Chapel Hill and listened to incendiary speeches from some early labor reformers. One of the girls stood on a pump and gave vent to the feelings of her companions in a neat speech, declaring that it was their duty to resist all attempts at cutting their wages. This was the first time a woman had spoken in public in Lowell, and the event caused surprise and consternation among her audience. It is hardly necessary to say that so far as practical results are concerned, the strike did no good. The corporation would not come to terms. The girls were soon tired of holding out, and they went back to their work at the reduced wage. The ill success of this early attempt at resistance on the part of the wage element seems to have made a precedent for the issue of many succeeding strikes. And indeed it did. And uh, the incendiary rhetoric she's referring to is how uh, and, and why the early labor movement in the United States uh, was so often assumed to be motivated by communist, communist ideology, which is violent and which is atheist. And to be fair, some of them were, you know, but not all. Some were just like these. You know, these girls worked from 5 in the morning till 7 in the evening. They, they were lured there with a promise of good wages. And then once they're there, they already left the home. Oh, yeah, we're going to cut your wages, you know. So one does not have to be a communist to, you know, to perceive that as an injustice. But anyway, they, they were characterized as communist. And, um, yeah. Okay. Um, the year the Mexican-American War ended, 1848, the Trappist order, well, let's see, hold on, let's see how, how long this is. Eh. No, I'll try to do it all in one. Um, 1848, the Trappist order made its first permanent establishment in the United States. The Trappists were derived from the order of the Cistercians of the Strict Observance. Well, they were derived from the Cistercians. The Trappists were the Cistercians of the Strict Observance. Um, in September of 1805, French Trappist from an abbey in Switzerland, uh, uh, La Valsante uh, in Switzerland, traveled from Pennsylvania to Louisville, Kentucky. From Louisville, they travel south to Bardstown, Kentucky, where Father Stephen Badin re-enters our story. He offered them one of the many pieces of land he acquired. They remained four years until their property was severely flooded in 1809, and their number was too small to rebuild. So they returned to France. Thirty-eight years later, in 1847, um, uh, Maxime, uh, Ma uh, Maximilien, or Maxime Maloyne, who was the Abbey of Melloray in France, sent two monks to Kentucky to try again. In the meantime, Father Badin had given the land to the sisters of Loretto, who named it Our Lady of Gethsemane. But when this follow-up attempt was made, the sisters were not using all of it. Bishop Benedict Flaget, whom we've met several times, uh, encountered them, the, the, the two follow-up Trappists, in Louisville and brought them to the site 15 miles southeast of Bardstown. The two monks were able to contract a deal for the land. Uh, on October 26th, 1848, 44 monks from the Abbey of Melloray uh, left with their leader, uh, Father Eutropius Proust. One of the monks died during the voyage. The other 43 arrived on December 11th, 1848 in New Orleans, Louisiana. They journeyed up the Mississippi on the riverboat steamer USS Martha Washington. They arrived at Gethsemane on December 21st, celebrated Mass on Christmas Day a few days later. 
By 1851, they had the buildings they needed to dedicate it as an abbey, the Abbey of Our Lady of Gethsemane, with Proust as its first abbot. In 1859, Proust resigned as abbot, and he returned to the Abbey of Melloray in France. At the time of his retirement, Gethsemane had grown, uh, had a total of 65 monks. He died in 1874 while serving as abbot of the uh, Abbey of Trefontaine in, uh, in Rome. Which brings us to President number 12, Zachary Taylor, with Vice President Millard Fillmore. Zachary Taylor was born in 1784 in Montebello, Virginia, but he was raised on the family's plantation in Kentucky. Enlisted in the Army, he rose through the officer corps through distinguished service in the War of 1812 and in the Seminole War. As a general officer in the Mexican War, he led the U.S. Army to four decisive victories, making him a desirable nominee for the Whig Party. A controversial candidate, owing to that he was a slave owner, as well as to his leadership in the wars, the Mexican War and the Seminole War, uh, that many, certainly many liberals, considered immoral. Taylor nevertheless had a loyal corps of supporters. Uh, former generals, successful military men, will always have loyal corps of supporters. His victory in the election was assured because uh, there were third-party candidates that got involved, so it divided the vote. Um, the, in the election of 1848. In addition to the Democrats and the Whigs, uh, the th third parties included the Free Soil Party and the Liberty Party. They also ran candidates uh, dividing the electorate, ensuring Taylor's victory. It was a narrow victory, but it was a victory. He died one year and four months after in, in office uh, on July 9, 1850. The official cause of death was gastroenteritis. Taylor's military victory over Mexico, well, he wasn't the only one, but, you know, I mean, the, the American victory over Mexico, uh, had set in motion a sequence of events that brought the American Republic to an end. It went to pieces, literally. Now, it was reconstituted, but reconstituted in a, in a, a different form. Um. I mentioned that uh, the war against the Seminoles and the war against Mexico uh, were, you know, were not universally embraced, and that there were many, you know, who 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 opposed it, who thought it was immoral. One uh, one version of protest against this. So we saw Harriet, you know, talking about the the strike, the labor protest, but there was another kind. There was a a moral protest that uh, against political injustice, just as the Lowell strike was a moral protest against economic injustice, uh, triggered, but this one, the, this, the one I'm going to talk about next, was triggered by the Mexican War. And it came from a person that I'm sure most of you have heard of, but in a different context. He's most famous in American history for his, uh, as a literary figure. This is Henry David Thoreau. Lived from 1817 to 1862. In 1846, one year after he moved into the famous cabin on Ralph Waldo Emerson's land at Walden Pond, Massachusetts. So Walden, you know, it ends up in many anthologies of American literature. Uh, so one year he moved there in 1845. The next year, 1846, Thoreau refused to pay his taxes as a protest against slavery in the South and against the war with Mexico. So if one refuses to submit to tax theft, of course, one is, one is caged, is deprived of freedom. So he went to jail over this for his refusal to pay taxes. Thoreau uh, then explained the situation uh, in a, a, an essay titled Resistance to Federal, no, excuse me, Resistance to Civil Government, published in 1849, and later became known uh, as Civil Disobedience. But the original title of the essay was Resistance to Civil Government. So here is an excerpt, quote, I heartily accept the motto that government is best, which governs least. And I should like to see it acted on, acted up to more rapidly and systematically. Carried out, 
it finally amounts to this, which also I believe. That government is best, which governs not at all. And when men are prepared for it, that will be the kind of government which they will have. Government is, at best, but an expedient. But most governments are usually, and all governments are sometimes, inexpedient. The objections which have been brought against a standing army, and they are many and weighty, and deserve to prevail, may also at last be brought against a standing government. The standing army is only an arm of the standing government. The government itself, which is only the mode which the people have chosen to execute their will, is equally liable to be abused and perverted before the people can act through it. Witness the present Mexican War, the work of comparatively few individuals using the standing government as their tool. For in the outset, the people would not have consented to this measure. I have to interrupt. I'm not entirely sure he's he's right there. I mean, I, I, um, because of the way the pre- I mean, after that engagement that occurred between the Nueces and the and the Rio Grande, since American troops were killed, uh, I mean, despite the background, I think the press had whipped up enough, you know, that if in that moment it had been put to a popular vote, a numerical majority might have voted in favor of the war. Um, I'm not sure, but I think that probably would have been. Now, if they had, you know, if they could look back and see the whole everything that happened in the war, then they, you know, in the, in the sober light of you know history, they 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 might think differently. But anyway, anyway, this is what he said. So I'll go back to the quote. This American government, which is it, uh, but a tradition. No, excuse me. this American government. What is it but a tradition? though a recent one, endeavoring to transmit itself unimpaired to posterity, but each instant losing some of its integrity. It has not the vitality and force of a single living man. This government never of itself furthered any enterprise, but by the alacrity with which it got out of its way. It does not keep the country free. It does not settle the West. It does not educate the character inherent in the American people has done all that has been accomplished. And it would have done more if the government had not sometimes got in the way. For government is an expedient by which men would fain succeed in letting one another alone. And as has been said, when it is most expedient, the governed are most let alone by the government. Trade and commerce if they were not made of Indian rubber, would never manage to bounce over the obstacles which legislators are continually putting in their way. And if one were to judge these men wholly by the effects of their actions and not by their intentions, they would deserve to be classed and punished with those mischievous persons who put obstructions on the railroads. (laughs) But to speak practically as a citizen, Unlike those who call themselves no government men, I ask for not at once no government, but at once a better government. Let every man make known what kind of government would command his respect, and that would be one step toward obtaining it. Must the citizen ever for a moment, or in the least degree, resign his conscience to the legislature? Why has every man a conscience then? I think that we should be men first and subjects afterward. It is not desirable to cultivate a respect for the law so much as for the right. The only obligation which I have a right to assume is to do at any time what I think is right. It is truly enough said that a corporation has no conscience, but a corporation of conscientious men is a corporation with a conscience. Law never made a man a whit more just, and by means of their respect for it, even the well-disposed are daily 
made the agents of injustice. A common and natural result of an undue respect for the law is that you may see a file of soldiers, colonel, captain, corporal, privates, powder monkeys, and all, marching in admirable order over hill and dale to the wars against their will, against their common sense, against their conscience, which makes it very steep marching indeed and produces a palpitation of the heart. They have no doubt that it is a damnable business in which they are concerned. They are all peaceably inclined. Now, what are they? Are they mad at all? Are small movable forts and magazines at the service of some unscrupulous man in power? The mass of men serve the state thus, not as men mainly, but as machines with their bodies. They are the standing army and the militia, jailers, constables, posse comitatus, etc. In most cases, there is no free exercise whatsoever of the judgment of the moral sense. But they put themselves on a level with wood and earth and stones. And wooden men can perhaps be manufactured that will serve the purpose just as well. Such command more respect than men of straw or lumps of dirt. They have the same sort of worth only as horses and dogs. Yet such as these even are commonly esteemed as good citizens. Others, as most legislators, politicians, lawyers, ministers, and office holders, serve the state chiefly with their heads. And as they rarely make any, any moral distinctions, they are as likely to serve the devil as God. A very few as heroes, patriots, martyrs, reformers in the great sense, and men serve the state with their consciences also, and so necessarily resist it for the most part, and they are commonly treated as enemies by it. How does it become a man to behave toward this American government today? I answer that he cannot, without disgrace, be associated with it. I cannot, for an instant, recognize that political organization as my government, which is the slave's government also. All men recognize the right of revolution, that is, the right to refuse allegiance to and to resist the government. When its tyranny or its inefficiency are great and unendurable, but most all say, but almost all say, that such is not the case now. But such was the case, they think, in the Great Revolution of 75. If one were to tell me that this was a bad government because it taxed certain foreign commodities brought into its ports, it is most probable that I should not make a do about it, for I can do without them. In other words, when a sixth of the population of a nation, which has undertaken to be the refuge of liberty, are slaves, and a whole country is unjustly overrun and conquered by a foreign army and subject to military law, that's Mexico, I think that it is not too soon for honest men to rebel and revolutionize. What makes this duty the more urgent is the fact that the country so overrun is not our own, but ours is the invading army. This people must cease to hold slaves, must cease to make war on Mexico, though it cost them their existence as a people. All voting is a sort of gaming, like checkers or backgammon, with a slight moral tinge to it, a playing with right and wrong, with moral questions, and betting naturally accompanies it. The character of the voters is not staked. I cast my vote, perchance, as I think right, but I am not vitally concerned that this right should prevail. I am willing to leave it to the majority. Its obligation, therefore, never exceeds that of expediency. Even voting for the right does nothing for the right. It is only expressing to men, feebly, your desire that the right should prevail. 
The broadest and most prevalent error requires the most disinterested virtue to sustain it. The slight reproach to which the virtue of patriotism is commonly liable, the noble are more likely to incur. Those who, while they disapprove of the character and measures of a government, yield to it their allegiance and support, are undoubtedly its most conscientious supporters, and so, frequently, the most serious obstacles to reform. Some are petitioning the state to dissolve the union, to disregard the requisitions of the president. Why do they not dissolve it themselves? The union between themselves and the state, and refuse to pay their quota into its treasury. Do not they stand in the same relation to the state as the state stands to the union? And have not the same reasons prevented the state from resisting the union which have prevented them from resisting the state. Now he's referring to the state of Massachusetts. Unjust laws exist. Shall we be content to obey them? Or shall we endeavor to amend them and obey them until we have succeeded? Or shall we transgress them at once? Men generally, under such a government as this, think that they ought to wait until they have persuaded the majority to alter such laws. They think that if they should resist, the remedy would be worse than the evil. But it is the fault of the government itself that the remedy is worse than the evil. It makes it worse. Why is it not more apt to anticipate and provide for reform? Why does it not cherish its wise minority? Why does it cry and resist before it is hurt? Why does it not encourage its citizens to be on the alert, to point out its faults, and do better than it would have them? Why does it always crucify Christ and pronounce Washington and Franklin rebels? As for adopting the ways which the state has for, for remedying evil, I know not of such ways. They take too much time, and a man's life will be gone. I have other affairs to attend to. I came into this world not chiefly to make this a good place to live in, but to live in it, be good or bad. A man has not everything to do, but something. And because he cannot do everything, it is not necessary that he should do something wrong. It is not my business to be petitioning the governor or the legislature any more than it is theirs to petition me. And if they should not bear my petition, what should I do then? I meet this American government or its representative, the state government, directly and face-to-face -face once a year, no more, in the person of its tax gatherer. This is the only mode in which a man is situated as I am necessarily, meets it. And it then says distinctly, recognize me. And the simplest, the most effectual, and in the present posture of affairs, the indispensable mode of treating with it on this head, of expressing your little satisfaction with and love for it, is to deny it to them. My civil neighbor, the tax gatherer, is the very man I have to deal with. For it is, after all, with men, and not with parchment, that I quarrel. And he has voluntarily chosen to be an agent of this government. How shall he ever know well what he is and what he does as an officer of the government or as a man until he is obliged to consider whether he shall treat me, his neighbor, for whom he has respect, as a neighbor and well-disposed man, or as a maniac and disturber of the peace, and see if he can get over this obstruction to his neighborliness without a ruder and more impetuous thought or speech corresponding with his action. I know this well, that if 1,000, if 100, if 10 men whom I could name, if 10 honest men only, if one honest man in this state of Massachusetts, ceasing to hold slaves, were actually to withdraw from this co-partnership, and be locked up in the county jail, therefore, it would be the abolition of slavery in America. 
for it matters not how small the beginning may seem to be. What is once well done is done forever. Under a government which imprisons any unjustly, the true place for a just man is in prison. A minority is powerless while it confronts the majority. It is not even a minority then, but it is irresistible when it clogs by its whole weight. If the alternative is to keep all just men in prison or give up war and slavery, the state will not hesitate which to choose. If a thousand men were not to pay their tax bills this year, that would not be a violent and bloody measure as it would be to pay them and enable the state to commit violence and to shed innocent blood. This is, in fact, the definition of a peaceable revolution, if any such is possible. If the tax gatherer or any other public officer asks me, as one has done, but what shall I do? My answer is, if you really wish to do anything, resign your office. When the subject has refused allegiance, the officer has resigned and the officer has resigned his office, then the revolution is accomplished. But even suppose blood should flow. Is there not a sort of blood shed when the conscience is wounded? Through this wound, a man's real manhood and immortality flow out, and he bleeds to an everlasting death. I see this blood flowing now. Christ answered the Herodians according to their condition. Show me the tribute money, said he, and one took a penny out of his pocket. If you use money which has the image of Caesar on it, and which he has made current and valuable, that is, if you are men of the state, and gladly enjoy the advantages of Caesar's government, then pay him back some of his own, whenever he demands it. Render therefore to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and to God those things which are God's. When I converse with the freest of my neighbors, I perceive that, whatever they may say about the magnitude and seriousness of the question and their regard for the public tranquility, the long and the short of the matter is that they cannot spare the protection of the existing government, and they dread the consequences to their property and their families of disobeying, disobedience to the government. For my part, I should not like to think that I ever rely on the protection of the state. But if I deny the authority of the state when it presents its tax bill, it will soon take and waste all my property, and so harass me and my children without end. This is hard. This makes it impossible for a man to live honestly and at the same time comfortably. It will not be worth the while to accumulate property, that would be sure to go again. You must hire a squat somewhere and raise but a small crop and eat that soon. You must live within yourself and depend upon yourself always tucked up and ready for a start and not have many affairs. A man may grow rich in Turkey even if he will be in all respects a good subject of the Turkish government. Confucius said, if a state is governed by the principles of reason, Poverty and misery are subjects of shame. If a state is not governed by the principles of reason, riches and honors are the subjects of shame. I have paid no poll tax for six years. I was put into jail. Uh, I was put in jail into a jail once on this account. And as I stood considering the walls of solid stone, two or three feet thick, the door of wood and iron a foot thick, and the iron grating which strained the light, I could not help being struck with the foolishness of that institution, which treated me as if I were mere flesh and blood and bones to be locked up. I wondered that it should have concluded at length that this was the best use it could put me to, and had never thought to avail itself of my services in some way. I saw that, if there was a wall of stone between me and my townsmen, there was a still more difficult one to climb or break through before they could get to be as free as I was. I did not for a moment feel confined, and the walls seemed a great waste of stone and mortar. I felt as if I alone of all my townsmen had paid my tax. 
They plainly did not know how to treat me, but behaved like persons who are underbred. In every threat, there was a blunder, for they thought that my chief desire was to stand the other side of that wall. I could not but smile to see how industriously they locked the door in my meditations, which followed them out again without let or hindrance, and they were really all that was dangerous. As they could not reach me, they had resolved to punish my body, just as boys, if they cannot come at some person against whom they have spite, will abuse his dog. I saw that the state was half-witted, that it was timid as a lone woman with her silver spoons, that it did not know its friends from its foes, and I lost all my remaining respect for the state, and I pitied it. Thus the state never intentionally confronts a man's sense, intellectual or moral, but only his body. It is not armed with superior wit or honesty, but with superior physical strength. I saw yet more distinctly the state in which I lived. I saw to what extent the people among whom I lived could be trusted as good neighbors and friends, that their friendship was for summer weather only, that they did not greatly propose to do right, that they were a distinct race from me by their prejudices and superstition. Is a democracy, such as we know it, the last improvement possible in government? Is it not possible to take a step further toward recognizing and organizing the rights of men? There will never be a really free and enlightened state until the state comes to recognize the individual as a higher and independent power from which all its own power and authority are derived and treats him accordingly. I please myself with imagining a state at least which can afford to be just to all men and to treat the individual with respect as a neighbor which even would not think it inconsistent with its own repose if a few were to live aloof from it not meddling with it, not embraced by it who fulfilled all the duties of neighbors and fellow men. A state which bore this kind of fruit and suffered it to drop off as fast as it ripened would prepare the way for a still more perfect and glorious state, which also, as I have imagined, but not yet anywhere seen. Okay, it goes on and on like that. So uh, you see, this, this is a uh, uh, protest, uh, was and still is just a part of American history is because of the you know the right of free assembly, the right of free speech, but the different kinds of protest. So as we'll see that some some protests got violent, as those the anti-Catholic protest in Philadelphia and New York, and then earlier in Massachusetts, um, and um, and we see the uh, we saw the labor protest, which were nonviolent of the Lowell Mill girls. Now we see this different. This is uh, more of a um, a voice of conscience type protest. Um, and we'll see others, but anyway, you, I'm, many of you, you know, you may have read Walden or at least portions of it in some anthology, but this this one is not uh, is not always in, included in such anthologies. Okay, uh, same year, um, on January twenty fourth, eighteen forty eight, nine days before the treaty ending the Mexican War was signed, a carpenter from New Jersey named James Marshall discovered a piece of naturally occurring gold in the American River, 40 miles east of Sacramento, California. By the end of the year, the amount of gold discovered in California became national news. President James Polk announced in December of 1848 that California had enough gold to pay the entire cost of the Mexican War many times over. That announcement, of course, was printed in all the newspapers. <clears throat> And it triggered an eruption of emotion that rendered many incapable of resisting the sin of greed and the danger of self-delusion. Once surrender is made to greed, inevitably the sin of envy follows in the form of resentment of those who discovered more or achieve success more swiftly. This opens the soul to the sin of anger, which all too often manifests as violence and homicide. This is the trajectory followed, beginning with the California Gold Rush of 1849. 
a wave of 300,000 prospectors descended on California in that year alone, driven by an avalanche of emotion. When confronted with the practicalities of mining, you know, the gold just doesn't just appear because you want it to, this level of emotion proved dangerous. Panning for gold dust in rivers that flowed from underground caves or actually digging underground you know, into such caves to separate veins of gold from worthless rock required endless hours of arduous backbreaking labor and might result in little more than piles of granite and sandstone. Added to this were the problems of acquiring the necessary equipment and finding food in areas that were often remote. When the emotional swell that filled some minds with the fantasy of hope was crushed by the grinding exhaustion, uncontrollable rage often resulted. This cycle precipitated a crime wave in California that the, the local authorities in California were simply unable to handle. The solution, many believed, was for California to join the Union as a state that therefore would have full access to the resources of a national government. The, um, so this raises the California problem. Uh, this is where we see the first, you know, the, the, the fruits, the instability that the victory of the United States over Mexico in the war uh, introduced into the Republic. And this, so this reignites the, the whole, you know, the slavery issue and the, you know, the, the states versus the federal government, but it's really slavery. I mean, it's what motivated it. Um, and this characterized the rest of the 1850s is the struggle. So the 1850s will be very different from the 1840s. So 1850 was the California problem. And that uh, brings us into another decade. So we will pause here, uh, having concluded the uh, decade of the 1840s, and we'll start with the 1850s next time. For now, thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned. <laughs>